Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. We're so glad to have you here today on this gorgeous November Monday. As you may know, some of you who attend regularly, we're here most every Monday from noon to one via Zoom. These are considered live hours by the Alabama Board of Social Work or classroom hours because we use a password protected evaluation. And we tend to do topics that are asked for on that evaluation when we question folks about what they'd like to see. And so one of the things that's sort of always on the list are topics relating to dementia. And we're quite blessed today as we have been in the past, to be joined by a fellow at UAB, Dr. Rebecca Sipma in the uh, Movement Disorders Clinic, who will detail for us a review of the various dementias, which I am most excited about hearing, as well as incorporating some other elements uh, into that review that I think you'll find refreshing and helpful. Um, again, we're accredited by the Alabama Board of Social Work, and also by the Alabama Board of Nursing, and each of those tell us that we can award you 1.0 contact hour for today's content. Again, a live hour because we use a password protected evaluation. That evaluation is online. And those of you who've been with us in the past and who are joining us by phone or otherwise not able to see your screen, perhaps you're working through lunch and joining us as well, let me read for you now the evaluation link, uh, which will be open when we conclude and password protected. That link is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters w w d as in david t as in teresa g as in girl two z as in zoo so again that's our evaluation link it is posted in the chat room for you all, uh, and uh, we are most happy again today to welcome Dr. Rebecca Sipma from UAB's Department of Neurology and the Division of Movement Disorders, who will share for us, uh, I think, a very robust discussion of the various types of and review of the various types of dementias. Thank you for joining Care Patrol. Thank you for referring your friends and clients who are in need of aging care navigation services, such as we provide. And Dr. Sipma, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. So again, like you said, I'm a fellow. I work in mostly movement disorders, which encompasses uh, Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, which are the most common ones where we'll have dementias associated with it. But there's also overlap. Oftentimes patients will have more than one problem going on at the same time. And so happy to walk you guys through a little bit of that here today. So I'll we'll go ahead and get started. So kind of reviewing our objectives, we're going to define dementia versus mild cognitive impairment because it's important to know kind of what we're dealing with here. And then we'll review the neuroanatomy as well as the pathology behind the different dementias that we'll cover today. And then compare and contrast kind of the different clinical symptoms, how they present or what are their main complaints and associated symptoms. Uh, we'll highlight some of the available non-pharmacologic as well as pharmacologic strategies for addressing these symptoms. Uh, and most of this is going to be what is uh, approved by the FDA, but we'll kind of mention some off-label use of medications here too. And then at the very end, we'll wrap up uh, discussing caregiver support and end-of-life care because that's where you guys are very much involved here as well. So brief outline here. Again, we'll be going through Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, as well as Huntington's disease. And like I said, those implications for caregivers and some of the end-of-life planning towards the end. 
All right, so cognitive changes. When a patient's presenting to us with us any sort of memory problems, first things we're kind of looking for is, is there a treatable cause that needs to be addressed first and foremost? So that can be thyroid dysfunction, vitamin deficiencies like B12 deficiency or thiamine deficiency are very common disorders which can present with cognitive impairment. Big thing too is looking at what medications, recreational drugs or having metal exposures are these patients having either at home or at work? And then is there an underlying uh, infection, which we can be treating and, you know, hopefully reversing most common ones in the neurological realm here, creating cognitive problems are going to be syphilis types of meningitis and encephalitis, which can be viral or bacterial or aseptic as well. Uh, and then similarly, mood disorders can present uh, depression in particular tends to look like having cognitive changes just because patients aren't involved or engaged with their environment nearly as much as they, they used to be or should be. Um, but again, treating that mood disorder can reverse a lot of those cognitive changes that they're having. And then sleep disorders as well. If you're not getting a good solid amount of sleep, patients aren't able to consolidate what they've seen or done that day. Uh, they can get very delirious and can have a lot of issues just stemming from that sleep problem. And so if we're picking that up on our history, we want to be addressing that first and foremost, and then reevaluate as to, okay, now that that's fixed, what do we still have underlying, which might be, there might be some baseline cognitive changes still. And so once we've ruled out the treatable causes, then we assess, is this more on the mild cognitive impairment or is this more of a major neurocognitive impairment? And so mild is going to be a loss of memory, which is more than expected for their age, but it's not interfering with their level of independence, their ability to take care of themselves. Versus once we cross into dementia is going to be where those mental abilities are impaired enough that they're not able to take care of themselves uh, on a regular basis independently and really interfering with daily life. So importance of, you know, why we're talking about this is you're going to be seeing this quite frequently, right? So the prevalence that we've got amongst the U.S. population over 70 years old is affected by a number of different things. Age is gonna be one of our biggest risk factors, right? And so over 90, you have almost 30% of the population having some sort of dementia. Uh, gets a little bit less when you're in your 80s at 16% and about 4%, 5% in patients in their 70s. Um, again, those who have lower levels of education tend to have slightly higher uh, prevalence of dementia. With men and women, it's about equal 10 and 9%. Uh, and then again, this is something that tends to disproportionately affect Hispanics and Black non-Hispanics more compared to whites. And so there is some racial disparities as well that we need to be aware of and looking for with our patients. And then and looking at it state by state. So here in Alabama, uh, age adjusted death rates per 100,000 is at 84.8. Again, you see in these dark blue states over here is going to be that higher prevalence. So whether it's a loved one or a friend of a friend or a patient that you're helping take care of, the odds are you're going to be seeing somebody who's dealing with one of these types of disorders. And then when we're talking about what type of disorder, most people are going to think of dementia as Alzheimer's disease. And majority of the time that's gonna be true. Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent of the types of dementia, but it's not the only type. So there's, uh, compared to uh, Alzheimer's disease, kind of second most are gonna be kind of our vascular dementia, frontal temporal dementia, and then like this Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia tend to be kind of on the spectrum. And so those are all fairly equally represented. And then you start getting into more rare causes of dementia, including Huntington's disease, infections like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, HIV, uh, and then alcohol-related dementia also is another important one to just make you guys aware of. We're not going to go into too much detail about the alcohol-related dementia today, but recognizing that can also very much play a role. Oftentimes, two patients don't just necessarily have one type of pathology when you know, they come to autopsy and we're looking at the brain slices, they might have multiple things going on. Um, and so this is just kind of the information we do have on patients who uh, have had dementia and have passed away. Dr. Sitma, may I interrupt? Yes. Um, the, of course. The slide, two slides ago about the devil mm -hmm. uh, death rates in Alabama, it, it, am I understanding correctly that because we have, you know, we're at 84.8, that 
we have more deaths in our state than these other states related to dementia. Is that, am I understanding that? Yeah, according to this 2019 sort of uh, statistics report that was kind of showing where it's most prevalent. Wow, so. okay, thank you. Yeah, all right. And so then a little bit briefly on the neuroanatomy, we're gonna get into the details of all of these with each specific subtype, but uh, it's really going to be important to understand the type of dementia you're dealing with based on what's going on in the brain itself. So different areas of the brain are going to have different activities or tasks that are very specific to that part of the brain. Uh, so frontal lobe is very much involved in planning and intelligence and personality. Temporal lobes tend to be more involved with uh, memory, and then there's language areas that are located here in the temporal lobe. You also have other language areas, uh, more posterior and in the parietal lobe, as well as in the frontal lobe. Uh, you've got visual uh, analysis and integration more in the posterior aspect. And then your motor and sensory tends to be more kind of in this central area in particular here too. Um, so we'll go through all of these kind of individually. We'll come back to this sort of slide in future sections. And similarly, not all dementia has the same pathology when we're looking at the cells underneath the microscope. So the patients who have died, we have the opportunity to look at their brains. We'll go through each of these individually as to kind of what you might see under a microscope or what's the genetic or other causes uh, that might contribute to these types of dementia. Uh, so we're going to jump right into Alzheimer's disease first, since that's going to be our most prevalent and the most common one that you'll see. So uh, Alzheimer's disease predominantly affects the temporal lobe. Uh, so here kind of looking at some scans of a healthy brain, you have some normal sized ventricles, you have normal kind of cortical areas here. Uh, so here you can see the ventricles are enlarged because you're getting that loss of white matter, especially here in those temporal lobes. So this area, this hippocampus is where that memory formation really starts. And so these patients will have predominantly loss of neurons in those areas. You also see some in other areas, but more out of proportion in that area in particular. And when we're looking under the microscope, you see a combination of different findings. There's amyloid plaques, there's neurofibrillary tangles of hyperphosphorylated tau in neurons. Uh, and so these are some of the things too, when we're trying to make a diagnosis, we'll look for when we do a lumbar puncture, we can analyze the CSF fluid and kind of determine do they have normal versus abnormal levels of this amyloid and tau in particular. And then getting into cognitive profile. So what is this patient looking like? What are their major symptoms memory-wise? So predominantly, they're going to have short-term memory impairment. They might also have some language and semantic knowledge deficits. So that can come in uh, the area of like naming objects, categorizing things, their verbal fluency, how well are they able to form a sentence and communicate their idea coherently. Uh, so oftentimes when we're in the clinic and testing, they'll have more problems creating like a list of animals than they would words starting with a specific letter. And so it's again that learning, they might still be able to like name animals if you show them pictures of them, but they might not spontaneously be able to like create that list in particular. Other areas that are impaired, executive functions, that's things like planning, uh, attention, and then their working memory. So they tend to have a little bit more prefrontal pathology if they're going to have more um, uh, impairment in these functions uh, on autopsy. Some patients might not have as much, and those tend to maybe not have as much prefrontal pathology. Again, that's varying patient to patient. Um, and then another one that you might be familiar with is kind of that disorientation to time and space. So that's things like getting lost, like when they're driving and not being able to find their way back home, uh, having difficulty navigating to the store that they've been to many, many times, things like that. And then uh, there's some notable variants that we'll discuss within a couple of these as well. So within the Alzheimer's uh, area, you can have patients who really have this posterior cortical atrophy. So on the scan here, this is uh, up at the top of the picture. It would be where your eyes and nose are. And then at the bottom here is kind of the back of the head. And you can see these spaces are much darker. There's a lot more tissue loss in this posterior region. This is a very dramatic example, just so you're aware of like where the abnormality is, but they can be much more subtle than this as well. 
Uh, so they'll have the same sort of pathology, those same exam findings underneath the microscope. But these patients, rather than the memory and executive dysfunction, they're going to have some combination of what we call there's a Balint syndrome, which involves optic ataxia, not being able to get the eyes to focus exactly on the target that you want, gaze apraxia, not being able to put together uh, kind of what you're seeing and all, all at once. And simultaneous is also this comprehending all of the parts are forming a whole. So the patient that I've seen like this has you know, very bouncy eye movements, can't focus on where he wants to be looking. And then you might be able to pick out like, oh, okay, there's a nose, but he's not gonna be able to recognize the entire face and recognize that there's a human standing in front of him. Um, Gerstmann syndrome is another syndrome that can be seen with some of this parietal and posterior atrophy. That includes trouble with calculations. They might confuse their left and their right. And so if I'm asking a patient, okay, show me your left hand, they might hold up the right one or point to something on the opposite side. Finger is no agnosia as well, not being able to identify, okay, this is a thumb versus the index finger, or the pinky finger. And then agraphia is the inability to write. Um, and this posterior region also includes your visual fields and your visual cortex. So being able to pick out everything that's happening in a space and perceiving color and then maintaining focus on the things that you're seeing would be primarily affected in a patient with this type of atrophy in particular. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. All right, so going back to typical Alzheimer's disease. Uh, associated symptoms primarily <clears throat> going to be behavioral with these patients. So, sorry, give me one second. And I had a question about the last yes. slide. I'm sorry to be the last slide guy, but um, mm -hmm. the visual, this part of the, the back of the mind, does that also, I assume it would affect depth perception? Um, yes. So part of it's going to be, uh, depending on which part of the brain is affected is going to determine which kind of quadrants within the vision are affected. And so if you don't have all of those quadrants, it should probably have some depth perception associated problems. Um, okay. but I've not, had a patient with this recently, so I, I haven't recently kind of looked into that. But again, if you're not seeing perceiving everything, they might have a hard time understanding where everything is at in space here as well. Right, right, right. That's what I was thinking. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. All right. So Alzheimer's disease associated symptoms. These are primarily going to be behavioral. So early on in the disease, it might just be some mild anxiety, some depression, irritability is kind of another common one. Uh, as the disease progresses, there tends to be kind of, again, a spectrum. Not everybody's going to have necessarily all of these different behavioral problems. It's very individual. Some patients tend to be more aggressive and angry. Others tend to be more anxious and fearful with their agitation. Some might have physical or verbal outbursts that are kind of uncontrolled. Restlessness too can look and look like a number of different things that can be like picking at things, pacing back and forth, not being able to sit still, um, can come in a variety of different formats in that regard. Sleep disruptions are also common, uh, trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, and then sundowning tends to be very typical of, again, uh, Alzheimer's dementia. That's where, again, around sundown, those early evenings or late afternoons, they're starting to get more confused where maybe they were sleeping most of the day and now all of a sudden they're awake, agitated, uh, confused as to where they're at and a lot of their symptoms seem a lot worse. So hallucinations can also come with these. This is more rare compared to some of the other ones, but I wanted to kind of discuss some uh, types here. So you can have spontaneous well-formed visualizations of objects, people, or animals. Uh, this can happen whether it's seeing something, you can also hear things that aren't there. Some patients will feel something like bugs on their arms or like there's something like a pin poking them as well as olfactory. So having some smells that aren't there. 
And then illusions are slightly different. So illusions are there's something there, but they're misidentifying that visual stimuli. So that might be like there's someone behind the curtain or there's a backpack in the corner and I think it's a dog or a bear or something else. But then I focus back on it and can eventually figure out it's a, an object and not that animal like I was seeing. So patients might have some insights, but it uh, as again diseases progress, they tend to be a bit more disturbing, a bit more trouble to tell what's real versus what's not, uh, and they can present a safety hazard. Right, if you're seeing you know a bear or a person or something that's very frightening to you, then that can create agitation. If they're still mobile, they might be trying to run or fight something, etc. And delusions come with a number of different dimensions as well. Delusions are considered fixed beliefs that aren't based in reality, and they'll persist even when they're presented with evidence to the contrary. So that can be things like worrying that their spouse is being unfaithful. Uh, types of persecution delusions can be that they're being attacked, that their family's conspiring against them, that the government is monitoring them and interfering with their life. Um, and those are different compared to like the somatic delusions, which would be something obsessed about their body or their health. Like, uh, oh, I have to take my medication at this time or this other bad thing is going to happen. Um, or there's a pain there that, you know, I, I absolutely have appendicitis, even though they've had scans and ultrasounds and blood work and none of that is showing up with any sign of that thing that they're worried about. Uh, so treating delusions and hallucinations, big part of that is going to be ruling out under like medical problems, uh, new medications can sometimes cause these things, and then uh, kind of assessing do they need something else in order to treat these, are they interfering. Um, Big thing for family and caregivers is going to be trying to reassure patient, try and distract them because they're trying to argue or convince them to the contrary with these delusions or sometimes these hallucinations. They're not going to be convinced and it's just going to create frustration for everybody involved. And so acknowledging them, acknowledging the feeling of, oh, that must be really scary for you. I'm so sorry. And trying to move on and doing something different is going to be sort of the best non-pharmacologic approach for these both in Alzheimer's as well as the other dementias that will cover that involve these. And then we'll kind of go into some other non-pharmacologic treatments for Alzheimer's disease in general. So first off, making sure any visual or hearing problems needing, you know, cataracts removed, needing hearing aids are addressed because if they can't see, if they can't hear what's going on around them, they're not going to be able to really engage with the environment. They're not going to hear that conversation. And so they're not going to remember that conversation. So removing those barriers wherever possible is going to be very important. And then kind of picking up on patterns. So why are these behavioral changes happening? There's usually some sort of triggering event. Is that they're moving into you know, a new home, a new nursing facility, they got admitted to the hospital and everything around them is looking foreign. Are there new caregiver arrangements that have, again, they're making them uncomfortable or uncertain, or they just don't remember these people. Sometimes it's being like, you know, asked to bathe or change clothes or something else that they they dislike to some degree. Again, we're not going to be able to avoid all of those, but at least recognizing them and then having a game plan is helpful for caregivers and family in these situations. Uh, and then looking into what's on their medication list. Do they have any infections, pain and other discomfort? So things like impaction or constipation can be a frequent cause. If they're retaining urine, that's another problem too, which can create either hallucinations or behavioral changes and worsen uh, dementia symptoms. And so trying to make their env environment stable and secure and comfortable as possible is going to be very important. Trying to remove challenges where possible. Um, so again, are they having trouble getting dressed where they need more Velcro shoes instead of the ties that they can't do anymore? Uh, do they have kind of the bottom one here too, is like a security object. Is there something that makes them feel more safe and more at home? Is there a spurt and blanket or a teddy bear like that? They really look on the look to for some security. Uh, again, we kind of reviewed a little bit of the looking behind behavior, avoiding confrontation. Do try and acknowledge requests and respond to them. You don't necessarily need to, you know, do what they're saying or uh, necessarily say, oh yeah, that delusion or that uh, thing is actually happening, but at least acknowledging it is, is helpful. And then trying to redirect their attention. Uh, knowing that some events are going to be taxing. So, you know, we're having to go to a doctor's appointment. So let's try and make sure we're not doing a whole lot before. And then right afterwards, we're going to plan for coming home and resting and not going to try and do too many other things that day. 
background noise too can be very uh, disorienting if there's a lot going on that can't keep track of everything. So trying to keep it minimal as possible is often helpful in these settings. All right, now on to Alzheimer's I, specific. May I interrupt you yep. again? I'm uh, sorry to be question boy. Um, uh -huh. But I, I'm really sort of asking your professional opinion. I have a client who I've met with a couple and we had a lovely conversation that one the spouse had recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. uh, and we were talking about you know what are the options today tomorrow down the road etc uh, and I felt like this person was very you know sort of early in their dementia uh, and then they they stopped me on the way out. We were separated. The spouses were separated and, and the one stopped me and proceeded to tell me about the infidelity of the other and that all the things that we had just discussed were a ruse um, around this hiding of the infidelity. And so I thought, well, first of all, I've totally misunderstood this situation. But then I wondered, how do I protect that other spouse? So if, if this occurred within the span of an hour and a half with me, this delusional thought, I wonder how often it occurs when I'm not around and, and when is too much for the caregiver spouse? I mean, who, how do I support them both? Does that make sense? Yeah. So those types of delusions are often very, very difficult for like, not just the patient, but also the spouse or family members too, because they're talking to kids or friends or other people and, you know, telling them that all of these things are happening. And so again, it's kind of going back to that person that they're making these accusations about and just kind of confirming of like, okay, these things aren't happening. All right. There are some cases where it is happening. So again, trying to tease out what is true, what is not is important. Um, and then again, uh, trying to redirect and um, not dwell on it is going to be important too, of like acknowledging that this is the disease talking. This is not their brain functioning normally. Some of these medications can be helpful in tamping some of those down. We do have patients where, again, they get them on the right medication, antipsychotic, and it helps reduce some of that. Um, and being there and being a support person for the caregiver is very important, right? Of their, they've now kind of lost the relationship with this spouse or loved one uh, that they used to have that which is very you know loving and close and helping them grieve through that process counseling is going to be very important right having somebody to talk to about those things and acknowledge the feelings they're having as they're going through all of this and that it's really it's a terrible disease which is really stealing that person away from them in a number of different ways um, not just, you know, mentally, but also relationally in that aspect. So uh, I don't know that there's one answer for every single situation, but it's trying to um, not blame the patient or the person who's having those, but blame the disease and acknowledge that and grief through that process, I think is important for patients and caregivers. That it's very helpful. Question? Thank you. The, the not yeah. dwelling on it, because I think yeah. the, the, the caregiver spouse engages mm -hmm. with decisions. Again, they want to prove that they're not doing that, right? And But you can prove to them all day long and that the logic is not going to work on a brain that is not functioning correctly, right? They, they've lost a lot of those pathways to be able to understand what you are telling them or presenting them. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course. All right. So big news here in the Alzheimer's disease side is there's now FDA approved anti-amyloid antibodies. So there's two of those. There's uh, the aducanumab and lecanemab, which are infusions. So the first is every month. The other one is every two weeks. So patients in order to qualify for this have to have either mild cognitive impairments or early uh, Alzheimer's dementia. They need to have baseline imaging. They have to prove that they actually have this amyloid pathology that can be done with either PET scans, which are specific for amyloid or looking at the CSF uh, fluid. And again, measuring the levels like I talked a little bit about earlier. And then they also do genetic testing for one of the ApoE4 genes, because if they have uh, both of those positive for ApoE4, then there's an increased risk of some of the side effects from these medications. And so if they're both positive, then we would recommend against potentially using these medications. Benefit would be that they can slow progression by about 33% over 18 months. 
we are still collecting longer term data on that. And again, it's not a cure, it's not reversing everything, but it can help slow some of that progression. So you have maybe a little bit more time or can get some of those other quality of life or bucket list sort of things done is kind of the goal. Uh, main side effects that we would see are gonna be amyloid related imaging abnormalities. Those can be things like inflammation or bleeding, which is why we get that baseline imaging, be able to tell how, is this happening? And if so, how bad is it? If it's really bad, we might need to stop the infusions and uh, again, kind of let the brain recover from that inflammation. Patients can also have infusion reactions. That's things like fevers, sweats, uh, kind of an allergic sort of reaction to the medication as it's going in. Headaches and falls have also been reported. And then for treatment of the cognitive symptoms, the mainstay of treatment here is going to be our acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So there's three different types. Uh, these are all approved for stages of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, denepazil and glantamine are pills. Rivastigmine comes in pills and patch forms. Uh, main side effects are going to be nausea and diarrhea. And then there's also memantine, which is approved for moderate severe Alzheimer's disease. This one tends to have more constipation, dizziness, fatigue, seizures, et cetera. And there is a combination pill of both denepazil and memantine, which is the numzeric, and that's approved for kind of the more moderate uh, stages of Alzheimer's disease. Other symptoms that we do have medications approved for, uh, Rixolti is one uh, that can be used for agitation associated with Alzheimer's disease. It can cause weight gain, which in some of our patients who are losing weight, that can be a good thing. Uh, sedation can be a problem if uh, it's, uh, they're too sedated all of the time. And akathisia is this kind of restless feeling or fidgety sort of feeling. And then Belsomra is a medication approved for insomnia and in mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Again, thinking of sedating medication and something that's trying to put you to sleep, patients can have some incoordination, so making sure that they're in a safe environment is going to be important. And then there can be some worsening of depression or suicidal thinking, which is important to monitor for in patients. And then there's a number of other off-label medications, which can be used for depression, for anxiety, for hallucinations and delusions. And it would be important to talk with the specific doctor about which ones might qualify, they might qualify for. Oftentimes with our depression and anxiety medications, they have side effects. And so, right, if there's one that causes weight gain and we have a patient who's already overweight, we might pick a different medication versus if a patient is having trouble keeping on weight, that might be a good fit for that patient. Others can be more sedating. If they're having a lot of trouble with sleep, maybe we can use one pill to help with some of their irritability as well as their sleep, uh, et cetera. So important to kind of individualize those ones with their doctor. All right, and moving on to Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. So these are essentially kind of on a spectrum depending on when the cognitive symptoms are starting. So dementia with Lewy bodies is going to have cognitive features as a very early symptom uh, within one year of the onset of motor symptoms or before that versus Parkinson's disease is going to be they started with motor symptoms and then at least a year after those motor symptoms started, then they developed dementia and cognitive impairment. So they're kind of on a spectrum because most of them uh, have the same sort of pathology and they are going to involve similar neuroanatomy. So these ones you find Lewy body, uh, uh, Lewy bodies, which are the pathological finding I'll show you on the next slide if involving the diffuse cortex. So it's kind of all over. It's not one specific area of the brain cortex as well as the basal ganglia. And so that's what I'm showing you here on this is a DAT scan. So this is the normal DAT scan. The dopamine system here uptakes the dye that we give and should have a normal kind of comma shape look to it. In our patients with Alzheimer's, uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia, you start losing some of that dopamine system and it typically looks asymmetric. It looks more like a period instead of that comma shaped. And on exam, that would be more of this Parkinsonism that we'll talk about here in associated symptoms. So they'll have, again, these uh, Lewy bodies, which stain dark on uh, the pathology here, and that kind of collects throughout. So there's a number of different reasons why this alpha synuclein is going to collect and deposit abnormally. Usually it's a combination of genetics, uh, the genetics which affect their ability to deal with inflammation. So there's... Um, lysosomal abnormalities, there's some autosomal dominant disorders, there's some autosomal recessive disorders, and there's also a number of ones where like we have lots of different little genes which probably affect your body's ability to 
uh, handle the environmental exposures and the inflammation you uh, interact with over the course of your lifetime. And in doing so, then you start getting these abnormal protein formations, which then spread throughout the rest of the body. And so where these collections start and where they spread to is kind of uh, determining which type of disease pattern you have. And so Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, multiple system atrophy, and then pure autonomic failure can all be associated with this alpha synucleinopathy. And then there's also some evidence that REM sleep behavior disorder has some of that early on. And then these can kind of progress to one of these other disorders as well, if it's been spreading from the brainstem into either the uh, cerebellum and other autonomic centers or the cortex and the substantia nigra. So going back to cognitive profile now for dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease dementia. Uh, so these patients compared to Alzheimer's disease are going to have more deficits in executive abilities, attention, and visual spatial. So here on the figure, you see Alzheimer's disease clock here. You have all of the numbers. They look pretty clear. We want the hands at 10 past 11. Those are pretty close. Here, this patient's numbers are all on one side. The hands, it's hard to tell which number they're going to. Your circle is kind of irregular and numbers are a bit smaller. So that's gonna be very typical of more of a dementia with Lewy body sort of picture. Same here with copying cubes and trying to draw these figures. Looks pretty good here on the Alzheimer's dementia one versus these are kind of just random lines. Can't clearly pick out a shape in the one from the dementia with Lewy body. And then you compare that to like short-term memory. So like we said, with Alzheimer's, short-term memory predominantly is affected there. Dementia with Lewy bodies, short-term memory, not so much affected. They got two out of the three that this person was tested on. And typically they're also able to get it if we give them prompts or cues uh, versus the Alzheimer's disease. They're not laying down that memory. They're not able to go back and retrieve it. It's just going to be, they don't get those short-term memory cues versus the dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease dementia. It's there, they're registering it. It might just take them a while to recall it and figure out where it was kind of in the brain. It's getting processed, it's there, it's just that recall and that attention is more impaired for patients. And again, some patients might have both Alzheimer's disease pathology as well as Lewy bodies, and those ones tend to have kind of a more rapid cognitive decline and a little bit worse off course. And then something very unique to these Lewy body Parkinson and Parkinson's dementias are cognitive fluctuations. Uh, these can be a bit distressing to caregivers as well as families if you don't understand what's going on. Uh, so rather than like a steady course of progressively worsening, you can have some pretty high highs and pretty low lows with these patients and they can come fairly rapidly. Uh, these spells can include staring off to space, being less responsive, looking more lethargic or drowsy. Their speech might, speech might be slurred or hard to understand. They might not make sense. And then they'll suddenly return to being clear-headed and intelligible. Uh, this might look like seizures to some people, but they don't have that period of confusion afterwards. It's really just during this episode that they're having it. Uh, these can last minutes. They can last days. They don't have typically other associated um, uh, blood pressure or heart rate changes. They can are often uh, brought to the hospital concerned for a stroke or a seizure, but any MRI or EEG is not really going to show any sign of those things. So big things are just ruling out that they've gotten an infection, taking them off anticholinergic medications, which can make these worse. And then some of the uh, medications for cognitive symptoms can be helpful in minimizing these, but we usually can't get rid of these completely. And so trying to have a structured and an active environment is helpful with these patients treating the medical comorbidities like we talked about. So the other big thing here too is orthostatic hypotension. So if you're not getting blood to the brain, then again, your brain's not going to be functioning optimally. So making sure patients are getting well hydrated and if they are having orthostatic hypotension, that's getting treated with medications. Uh, Acetylcholine and esterase inhibitors are going to be our mainstay of treatment for cognitive uh, problems here. So rivastigmine is the one that's actually approved for use in Parkinson's dementia. This is an episode will be considered off-label, but has a very similar mechanism of action. Similarly, memetine sometimes beneficial in some of the studies, but not officially approved for use in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. And so 
Other associated symptoms here, so Parkinsonism is going to be referring to the motor symptoms. So that's slowness, rigidity, rest tremor, that's trouble getting up, that's trouble walking. Uh, they get slower as they're continuing to do the same movements. They tend to be more stooped and might have increased risk of falls due to postural instability. Parkinson's tends to be more asymmetric. Dementia with Lewy bodies tends to be more bilateral, but both are can be bilateral here. And with treatment for the movement symptoms, oftentimes it's going to be physical therapy and speech therapy, as well as trying to increase the dopamine in the, the body. So that's mainly going to be carbidopa, levodopa uh, to help convert uh, some of those precursors into dopamine in the brain to help with the movements. And then other common symptoms that you'll see in these patients are going to be the REM sleep behavior disorder that's acting out of dreams, kicking, screaming, punching, that can be a danger to patients and family. Autonomic dysfunction can take a number of forms and is all symptomatic in management. Mood changes like depression, anxiety, and apathy are also very common and so typically addressed with some sort of antidepressant, anxiolytics, and counseling. And then hallucinations and delusions are also common here. Hallucinations are one of the hallmarks, too, of dementia with Lewy bodies, if that's preceding, again, the motor symptoms or is out of proportion to the other cognitive symptoms. That's going to be a leaning towards a dementia with Lewy body compared to Parkinson's dementia or compared to an Alzheimer's disease sort of one. Uh, big thing here with the, the hallucinations I wanted to highlight is that the treatments here compared to Alzheimer's disease are going to be a little bit more limited. So because of those movement problems, a number of the antipsychotics we might use for hallucinations in Alzheimer's disease would make movements worse in Parkinson's patients. And so the ones that are okay to use are going to have the least impact on those motor systems are going to be quetiapine, clozeril, or pimavanserin. So they all do carry a black box warning, however, of increased risk for untreated psychosis. Are they, so I'll carry a black box warning of higher mortality risk for patients over the age of 65. But again, leaving that psychosis untreated is also very dangerous. And so you don't want to necessarily um, not give them a medication if it would be in their best interest, if they're, you know, trying to run away or doing things that are very, very harmful to themselves or others. Um, and then some of the neuroleptics like Haldol Risperidone too, rather than, you know, just causing minor uh movement problems, they can have a hypersensitive reaction, uh, which can produce some irreversible Parkinsonism as well as cognitive changes or even a neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which winds them up in the hospital because of the severe autonomic dysfunction and rigidity that can come with it. So being very careful with which medications we're giving to these types of patients is, is key. All right, questions on that one really quick. Otherwise, we'll move on to vascular dementia. All right, so vascular dementia is going to be highly variable. Uh, all right, so this one is going to be depending on where the strokes are at. So you can have images like this where you have a lot of subcortical strokes and white matter changes, or you can have something like this figure B where this one had a posterior stroke. So there's a lot more atrophy. It's very asymmetric. And this area in particular is atrophied. Or you can have lots of little spots of little bleeds and very important um, uh, very important areas which can contribute to the dementia. And so you can have a number of different kind of pathologies and causes here. So you can have a large vessel occlusion, which affects the whole half of the brain. You can have a bleed in a very important area. You can have lots of little micro infarcts, et cetera. And then the cognitive profile here is going to be based a lot on the history. So is the onset of dementia within several months of a recognized stroke, or is it an abrupt onset of symptoms with sort of a stepwise progression? Because again, usually Alzheimer's and these other neurodegenerative ones are going to be a slow, steady decline. Strokes, though, are kind of more like an abrupt drop off of there's a sudden immediate change. Then again, because the locations are variable. There's not going to be one uniform, like, okay, it's always going to be short-term memory loss. Okay. It's always going to be this other thing. But in general, what studies have found is there's the more impairment in an executive function and the frontal cortex compared to Alzheimer's disease, less short-term memory and less visual spatial dysfunction. But again, if you're having a stroke that very much hit the hippocampus, they might have some short-term memory loss. If you have 
a stroke that really only hit that occipital lobe, they might have more visuospatial dysfunction. So kind of a little caveat on that side. And then again, the associated symptoms are going to vary. That'll be depending on where their strokes are. Some might have a hemibody weakness and numbness if they had a large uh, hemispheric stroke. They might have visual deficits in that posterior region if that was involved. And again, there's uh, the frontal language area and the temporal language area. So they might have some aphasias or speech deficits too if those were involved. Unlike the other, other uh, dementias we've talked about, the drugs for memory really aren't helpful here unless they have a combination of the vascular plus the Alzheimer's dementia. So if it was kind of, they had some maybe Alzheimer's earlier and then they had a stroke, we might use some of the denepazil to see if that helps them a little bit, but they aren't gonna have as robust of an a response to the medications. Cause it's not like their cells are there and they're just mildly malfunctioning. It's they had ischemic loss of those cells. So they're not there for these medications to work on. A big part of treatment too is gonna be stroke prevention. So making sure that they're not having another stroke, which is gonna, uh, kind of cumulatively add on to their deficits. And so that's going to be things like either antiplatelet or anticoagulation, depending on what was causing the stroke initially, controlling their cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, addressing AFib or other cardiac abnormalities, which can throw clots and cause more uh, strokes. Smoking cessation is going to be a big one, and then increasing their physical activity. And a lot of the treatment too, then is going to be uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, if they have specific deficits from something like that. Again, social interactions, and then making sure they're safe, right, is going to be the big focus is there. Frontotemporal temporal dementia is going to be, again, frontal and temporal, which should make sense. This is a PET scan, which is looking at glucose uptake and activity. So it should be bright kind of all throughout here. This patient has darker regions in that frontal and temporal regions, which would be considered consistent with FTD uh, and can help us differentiate between Alzheimer's and FTD. And this one is a, essentially a tauopathy. Uh, then about studies are show varying percentages, but maybe 10 to 40% do have uh, specific genetic causes. And then head trauma does confer about a 3.3 fold higher risk of development of FTD later in life. Again, those frontal lobes are very close to the skull and some very sharp uh, bony areas and so can cause some damage, which creates abnormal proteins. The most common of variant of FTD is going to be behavioral variant. Even within this, there's a couple like different profiles depending on which part of the frontal lobe is more involved. So there's going to be one, patients who have inappropriate actions, disinhibition. Uh, there can be hyperorality, hypersexuality to uh, making comments or doing things that are not not consistent with who they were previously. Perseveration is kind of this. Uh, thoughts on loop and being hyper fixated on things. You can also have patients who are more withdrawn. There's a lot of apathy, there's loss of insight, they're not as engaged as they used to be and they're not eating nearly as much as they used to be either because they're very picky about which foods are involved. Very commonly they have impaired judgment as well as executive function. Uh, so they might not be aware of all of these problems. These are again, very distressing to caregivers and family or seeing all of these changes and patients not fully aware of what's going on. They do have more preserved short-term memory compared to Alzheimer's disease. And again, they don't have as much of the visual spatial abnormalities compared to PD and DLB. Another notable variant here, you can have primary progressive aphasia, which is very much impaired language abilities. And then there's also FTD ALS, which in addition to the dementia, they might have the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is that significant weakness, muscle wasting, uh, and uh, very impairing as well. So non-pharmacologic uh, treatments, we covered a little bit of this previously too, is avoiding that confrontation and arguing. Again, focusing on this is the disease, which is really stealing this person and from you and talking with some of these inappropriate comments and everything. Uh, trying to structure and use schedules to help with some of the behavioral issues. If you're having hyperorality and uh, perseveration on food, trying to lock cabinets in the fridge, distract them with other activities, keeping them busy at times when they tend to be more prone to eat uh, or, you know, keeping them out of situations, which tend to be triggers for them. If they're, uh, 
in if they have a lot of those language abnormalities, making sure you're speaking slowly, clearly, and in short phrases can be helpful. And then a speech therapist might also have communication boards or other tools, which can be helpful in communication. Being patient and waiting for response is another thing. Again, patients can get frustrated of like, I'm trying to form the words, I'm trying to get it out. It's just really, really difficult for me. Um, and again, it'll depend on their specific symptoms, but there's a range of different antidepressants and anxiolytics, which can help. And then the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors like genepazil, we actually avoid in these patients because they can make some of the symptoms worse. And then briefly on Huntington's disease. So this is going to affect the caudate lobes and the diffuse cortex. So again, looking at MRI, you have a lot more space here in the sulci with the cortical atrophy. And then here you have a well-shaped caudate head kind of protruding into the ventricle. Here in the HD brain, it's a lot flatter. It doesn't have that rounded caudate head. And this comes from a CAG repeat in the Huntington gene on chromosome four. It's autosomal dominant, meaning about 50% of the kid from a of kids from a patient might inherit it. And then it produces an abnormal protein, which is toxic to the neurons, as well as a number of other uh, per, uh, cells, but pre predominantly caudate and some other uh, neurons. The age of onset typically correlates with the number of repeats. Patients often are 30 to 50 years old at onset, and then death occurs 10 to 30 years after. They really have a lot of impaired judgment, slower processing, and disorientation to the time. They have fewer language problems, but the dysarthria that comes with some of the motor symptoms can really impact their communication. And because they're younger at onset, this really impacts their ability to work. And so these patients are going to be more severely disabled a lot earlier in life than your typical, you know, Alzheimer's is just in your 70s, 80s, 90s. These are, you know, 30, 40 year olds in the peak of their, you know, working life when they can't communicate and they have impaired judgment. So they commonly also have mood disorders as well as movement disorders. And so on the movement disorder side, that's chorea, just kind of quick jerky movements, which can be small initially and can get larger and larger. Those interfere with walking, uh, swallowing, speaking, fine motor tasks, et cetera. They can also have some of that Parkinsonism, which is that slowness, stiffness, rigidity, uh, like we talked about earlier, as well as dystonia, which is an abnormal posturing and cramping of muscles. So unfortunately, there's no current medications approved for cognitive symptoms. There are some ongoing clinical trials, so hopefully we might have something soon. Uh, and then the motor symptoms will treat primarily with our VMAT2 inhibitors to help reduce chorea. Botulinum toxin injections can be useful for dystonia. And then within our mood symptoms, we again use a number of different antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anxiolytics, depending on what their symptoms are. And some of those antipsychotics can also help with our motor symptoms, specifically chorea. So getting into a little bit on caregiver support and resources. So getting patients and family connected with a multidisciplinary team is very important. So it's a combination of your primary care, neurologists, social workers, therapists, palliative care teams, and hospice care teams as well, uh, depending on kind of what stage they're in. Education is going to be kind of where we as doctors, but also the nurses, social workers are very important, helping family and patients understand the disease and symptoms that they're facing, medication options, resources, and really safety measures too, because that's predominantly what's going to be uh, impacting them at home. Support groups are a wonderful area, again, for patients and especially for caregivers. Disability, helping them work through that paperwork and uh, get their benefits from that is going to be important to when they're not able to hold the jobs they used to be able to, and then helping build a support system, right? So this is not a, uh, you know, visit the doctor one time, you get on one medication, it cures it, it's done. This is a many year sort of process. So connecting with them, is there a religious organization, a church, or a, a group that they're affiliated with that might have some extra support or people who want to help out? Are there volunteer organizations in their neighborhood that are useful for providing respite care or meal services or something else that's going to be a uh, bonus to that family as they're dealing with all of the stressors? I've included a number of online resources. So Alzheimer's Association is a great resource. The Lewy Body Dementia Association also has a lot of handouts on non-pharmacologic therapy. So again, how do you cope with all of these delusions, hallucinations, uh, uh, get ready for a move and things like that. So these are some good resources to point patients and caregivers to or to look at yourself if you're dealing with someone who's going through one of these uh, diseases. And then a little bit on end-of-life care and planning. 
like I said, again, no cures. These are uh, some new medications, which are maybe helping slow progression, but don't reverse it. And helping family and patients recognize, like, you don't necessarily need this thing right now, this extra resource right now, but you are going to need more assistance over time. So let's start thinking about that now before it gets to like an emergency or a like, hospitalization or a critical point where we can't deal with how things are right now. So thinking ahead about finances and retirement, uh, driving is another big one too, right? So patients aren't going to want to give up driving easily. There are ways to get them evaluated, to see if they are safe to continue driving. Uh, mobility, right? Helping them get around the house. Do they need walker or wheelchair or bed lifts to help with caregivers changing them? Swallowing changes as well, kind of getting those evaluated early and trying to address them with exercises or other modifications. And again, these are going to have variable time courses, depending on the time of, type of dementia and other medical comorbidities. So it's not like, you know, oh, for sure, you're going to have this number of years. It's highly variable, right? You, patients can still have a cancer. They can still have a heart attack. They can have other things come up as well. So like we said a little bit earlier, building that support team is important, making sure that the patient as well as the caregivers have someone to talk to, whether it's a counselor, a friend, support groups. Um, again, talking with financial and legal experts is going to be important just to timing out of like when is disability or retirement going to be necessarily necessary or, you know, financially feasible, having them uh, like set up who is power of attorney, talk with family members before we're getting into emergency situations as to, you know, what are things that would be acceptable or not acceptable if they were in certain medical condition. And then safety, right? What uh, sort of things around the home are needed? Do they need grab bars? Do they need to remove the rugs that are a tripping hazard? Do they need to expand doorways so they can get things in and out like they need to? Patients who are alone for periods of time might need a medical alert service, right? So they don't end up on the ground for hours until someone else comes over. Uh, having wallet cards available too with diagnosis and family doctor information is important, especially if you have a patient who's a flight risk, right? They're out wandering, don't know what's going on. Having something with them is going to be helpful for people who can get them the appropriate care. And... Then starting those conversation of like, what are you able to do at home? What is safe at home? Everyone wants to try and stay at home as long as possible. Unfortunately, with some of these patients, that's just not possible to do safely or to, you know, keep the caregiver from burning out. So when is it going to be a better fit to maybe think about a memory care facility or a nursing facility or hiring caregivers to come into the home? Um, and then another just brief thing here. So again, when we're talking about medical decisions with advanced dementia, uh, it's really not recommended that we use the feeding tubes. Um, it's better to have them enjoying whatever they can orally. Uh, as dementia progresses, again, that swallowing risk becomes higher, risk of infection becomes higher, but really it's not recommended that we insert feeding tubes in patients who have this advanced dementia and helping them uh, enjoy daily life, right? It's gonna be quality of life. We can't necessarily reverse this disease, but we can still enjoy uh, the great moments that we do have with family members, with friends, et cetera. So trying to prioritize times with the ones they love, forming memory books with pictures and mementos, not challenging them on like, oh, do you remember who this is? Just telling them fun stories, uh, putting on music that they like, enjoying time outdoors can help boost mood and help kind of keep those day and night cycles intact as well. Some people find it helpful for, you know, gratitude booklets or journals and things like that too. So uh, that should bring us to the end of our time here. So like we said, we reviewed some of the definitions, a number of different types of dementias, including what that means for caregivers and that's to kind of bring up early in the course is to end of life care and planning. So uh, these are some of the resources I used and happy to open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sitman. I knew that I would feel like my hair was blown back when you were done, and it does feel that way. And, and I picked up a lot of interesting tidbits, as I'm sure everyone else did. Um, I will read, as we're nearing the end of the hour, I'll read again our uh, evaluation link. It's online. You must do the evaluation in order to get credit for this hour. The link is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com 
forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters w w d is in david t is in teresa g as in girl two z as in zoo and our password is capital d dementia capital d lowercase e m e n t i a dementia is our password thank you dr sitma so much of what you described as, as support and resources is what we do at care patrol which is sitting with folks and helping them understand where they are in their process whether they're in a planning stage or a recently diagnosed or very far along in their progression and so it was interesting to see that the things that we do naturally were things that you recommend i appreciate that you've got a lot of nice comments uh from folks there in the chat room but we have no questions do you have anything to add or i i do before we go i want to tell you i really hope you have a terrific and 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 you know just beneficial time in Cuba. I know it will be rewarding for you. Thank you. Yeah, no, again, happy to help you guys get a little bit better understanding on dementias because like you were saying, you guys are very key players in supporting these patients and families in this. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for going to Cuba to teach others. And thank you all for being with us. Everyone have a great week. Thanks so much.